Dictionary.com. You ever heard of that? Well, if you do, you'll be hooked on it. But I remember that I went back and uh, I was searching out all my family and relatives and all those kinds of things. Continue to do that. It's kind of cool to uh, kind of know your history, where you've come from, know what your DNA looks like. You go in and say, how long has this person lived? Where did they live? You know, I wonder if that traveled over to me. What did they die of? You know, all those kinds of things you do as part of your ancestry. But I remember that one of the things that surprised me a few years ago was that um, I've forgotten that when I was a kid, uh, my grandfather, uh, Dix, used to come over to our house. And uh, when he'd come over, he, he wouldn't talk anything about the war. So I didn't know he ever served in the war until one day, I remember I was looking at a car book. I'll never forget this. And he came in and somebody said, you know, he was in World War I. And I remember he came over and he took a piece of chalk and he wrote in my, in my big book of, uh, big color book thing I had, he wrote in there what division he served with. And uh, that didn't mean anything when I was a kid, you know, I had no idea, you know, I played with the cow, cowboys, but I had no idea what that was about. I remember he wrote in there that he was part of what was called the Rainbow Division. You all know about the Rainbow Division? Well, I tell you, it, you got it. Okay, very good. Um, Anyway, he's part of the Rainbow Division, and uh, it was out of World War I, which started its base here in Iowa, of all things. Formulated itself and then included people from all the branches of, I mean, all the areas of, across the United States who served in that. Became a very famous division, what it did. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow uh, when I have the chance to do the uh, uh, Memorial Day service a little bit. And just, just talk about those things, about the people, who they were, and, and their bravery. My grandfather always... The whole thing. And I found his picture online. Have him dress up with this outfit on, you know? You know, like the doughboys wore and the whole thing. And I thought to myself, are you serious? But my grandfather was part of that. And I think, man, what a, what a piece that is. Memorial Day, it's a, one of those days of legacy. You know, it kind of mixes it up for us. You, you know the beginning of, of Memorial Day? You know where it all came about? Um, and, and really, it was here in the United States. And it really, uh, it was during the Civil War time. And in the Civil War time, the, the veterans of the South, people who were, who were killed and buried, especially in the Southern Confederacy, were the ones that used to have something they called Decoration Day. And they celebrated Decoration Day in the South. And uh, they were very much in honor of that. They would decorate the graves, do all that kind of stuff. I remember when I was a kid growing up, some people would call it Memorial Day, others would call it Decoration Day. <laughs> And I really had no idea about that, except in, um, uh, then along came in, uh, was it November of uh, 1862, 1862, when, uh, what? 1863. 1863, when a guy, no, Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of the United States, uh, did his famous uh, presentation speech on the, on the area of Gettysburg, and he talked about let these who died not die in vain, you know, remembering them as part of that. And that's where it then began to filter up. People were already doing it. People who saw the kind of honor that was holding on in the South, that was all part of the United States, but, but man, bringing that uh, Paul are part of us. And then in 1967, when it was actually put together in a way, um, when it was formalized and then turned into officially Memorial Day as part of that, a time that we remember, and especially the time, the opportunity of seeing that those that have passed on, part of our family and others, and to use them as part of our, our time of remembrance too, is that... Have you gone out to the cemeteries yet? Connie and I went out this week. We went out and we did things out in the cemetery. Went around and visited all our relatives. Put some of the family in our car. Took them with us, you know, and walked around. Sometimes we'd walk around. We didn't even know the people. We'd read the tombstones, you know. There's something about folks that died in the early 1900s, 1800s. They put a lot of things on their tombstone, you know, and as part of that. It was a great, great time. We had a lot of flowers. We put them out, did what we needed to do. We had some extra flowers. We just went around to graves that... Looked really old. You couldn't read on there. We just stuck some flowers along those, you know. I just think came to myself, you know, I'm sure the folks are saying, thank you very much for honoring me. On the other hand, I'm sure those people will walk out there along there and think, well, how'd they get one? They, that's so long ago, nobody remembers those folks. And I thought, no, nope, we don't have to remember them. There's a remembrance there by who they are. And what a wonderful tribute that is, you know. When my parents passed away, one of the things Connie and I used to do, we'd take our grandkids out and we'd have a picnic uh, out at the, at the cemetery. A little odd. You ever see that? A little odd. People, I'm sure, looked at us and thought, what the heck are you doing out here? But that was one of Connie's things. She said, let's go out and have a picnic. And we'd do that. And uh, after my mother passed away especially, we'd go out and we'd do that. We'd bring some of our kids. Mark, who you met, plays guitar. He went out and we'd sing I'll Fly Away. And uh, we just had a great time out there, you know. Our grandkids used to say, my grandparents are crazy. <laughs> Just what we did. We had to go out to the cemetery 
And they had to play the songs. We got to sit there and everything. And I thought, yeah, that's right. That's what it's about, you know. Because really, those cemeteries are not places of death. They're places of, of, of memory and they're places of remembrance. They're beautiful places. And to go out and to see that and be part of that, that was great. I took some rocks in my pocket and I went up to each of the graves and my family. I put a rock on top, you know. Um, what they do in Israel a lot, you know, it's kind of remembrance, some sown of remembrances, like you talked about, you know, and I just put that there. It was great. I went to my father's grave and I had a fish plaque I found. And my father loved to fish, you know. I'm getting ready to go to Canada. So I took that fish plaque and I put it on his side of the grave, you know, because I thought, there it goes. People come, they go, oh, remember him? He used to fish all the time. And I thought, I'm going to put that out there, you know. I went to my son's grave and uh, had a chunk of, uh, of, uh, of um, birch wood from up in Canada I brought back. I put that on the grave, you know. We put all kinds of little flashy sparklers and everything else, you know. And I just thought, man, what a great day. Great day of remembrance and talking about people and who they are and part of our life and how they were important for who we are. But in reality, what I really give thanks for is how those people were really lights for us, you know. In the midst of darkness in our lives, those people were there for us. And oftentimes they were the ones who taught us and, and, and really brought us to the place that we are today. Would you agree to that? People that were part of our lives that didn't let us wander, even though we hate to come to church sometimes, they made sure we were here. They made sure we were in Sunday school classes, made sure we had Sunday school teachers as part of that whole thing. When I, when I, when I was a kid growing up, it was my grandmother. She was an important part of my life. You know, When I was a kid growing up, when you did nice things and you got through things successful, you know, they take you up to a place called the Duncan store on the corner. What it was, a fill full of little gifts, you know? And you go up there and you pick out a little gift or something. It was always a, a gift of memory. You know, something special happened. You put that out, and I love that. I took my grandmother up there once, and she said, what would you like? And, you know, there's so many things I want in that store. I don't know what caused this. I said to my grandmother, I want a Bible. My grandmother says, well, I'm going to buy you your Bible. And I thought, really? Grandma went over. She picked out the right Bible for me, the one with the zipper cover. You don't see those anymore. It was a zipper cover with a cross on it. Man, life. It was my Bible. It wasn't one of those other things. It was my Bible. I took that home. My grandma opened it up. She took the front cover. She opened it, and then she started writing in the front cover. Presented to. Oh, from. A little place for her to write down. I hope you continue. I hope you'll, you'll continue to be in God's service in some way. Then she signs it, 1960, you know. And I thought, are you kidding me? I've taken all my books out, opening up tubs, giving some away, doing different things with it. And there was that Bible. It was still there, a little cracky, but it was there. And I just wanted to make sure I opened it up and there was that little tribute page inside, you know. And I, I thought to myself, Grandma, I kind of continued in that service. And so I owed all to you being the one who called it out, you know. It's like we do today. Sometimes we call that out. In churches, I used to do that to kids. Sometimes I'd say to kids, you know what? I said, the way you act, the way you do everything else, I think someday you're going to be a minister. And you know, it was so amazing to watch those kids, how some of them have grown and been part of that and how many have found themselves. I, I'm just thinking the other day, the number of people that we had at camp and other places that have gone into Christian service. Now, a lot of those people are people we said, you're, you're special. <laughs> God's got you marked. And I remember every time I do baptism for kids, I oftentimes say, you know, oh, I said, this is a good one. This one, see how he's like, a, he's got an old soul in him. You know, the way he looks, his eyes, his face, his expression. He, he's probably going to be a pastor, you know. And I always love that. So people always say, you remember when you said my son or daughter was going to do that? It's that prophetic word that we have. It's part of being that light of Christ that we do. That's what makes this church the church. That's who we are. It wasn't by accident that they started that little church down there at the corner. You finally moved it up here and got it together. But those people were thinking about that. They didn't put it down some hidden road somewhere. They put you right center dab in the town to say, you know what? This is who you are. This is who we are. We're, we're, we're the people of God. We want to make a difference in the whole thing. It's like Barbara's words that she shared with us today about, the, about what the scripture talks about. We're the light of the world. That's what it's to be about. It's a long history of our, our legacy. It's our history. It's part of our DNA of who we are. That, that we are part of the people who seek to pass that along to generation to generation. Why? Because it's important for us. We give power to that. We give praise to that. When we say to people, you know, I want you to grow up. You know, it's okay thing to say. Plant a seed in them. Plant God's seed in them. And many of them do. Even if they don't go into what we call officially Christian service, nonetheless, they're called to that service and who they are and what they do. 
It's like when Paul says that we're to be ambassadors. He said, that's how you're going to be known. It's not my work is going to come through you. He talks about the fact that, you know, hold on. You remember how I've been with you for those 40 years and beyond. Remember how I was there with you in times of testing and trial. I see that every time when I get a prayer thing coming from this church saying, we got somebody to pray for, like Marilyn this week. You know, pray for her. She gets ready to go to her testing and everything else. And I think to myself, that's what it's about is that we're alive. It's who we are. It's who we are as a church and and the importance of that. You know, there are a lot of people who would have been shipwrecked, (laughs) you know, had it not been for the church and some people, some they don't even know, but we prayed for them. And you know what? God uses those prayers, opened up all of heaven and sought to make a difference in their life and in their living. Uh, My grandmother was one of those. I keep talking about my grandma. She's one of those people. When I was a little kid, you know, I was a little rousty guy. We had a bunch of rousty guys, a bunch of boys in our EUB church, and uh, we, were, we were not known for being the most uh, um, focused and patient. And in fact, we got to be kind of a group where nobody really wanted to be with us and teach us because we were a little hard on some of our Sunday school teachers. And I remember when it came time to find somebody for Sunday school teachers, they found anybody they could find. Then it came to a time they couldn't find anybody for our group, and we thought, in some ways, it's like a badge of courage. We thought, yeah, we're the tough ones. We didn't get anybody to teach us because we're just, we're just a bunch of wild boys, you know? And I got it. Guess who volunteered to be our Sunday school teacher? My grandmother. You believe that? I tried to talk her out. I think, Grandma, you don't want to do this because I don't want you to do this because that means I got to clean up my act, you know? <laughs> and man, I tell you, she became my Sunday school teacher. And boy, but you know what she did think? She was outside the box. She was a, you know, one of those people who are paradigm shifters. She did things, right? Get us out there, go into things, visit people, talk about things, do things. You know, that was all about, put our faith into action. That's what she was all about. Some Sunday schools, you just came and you did your thing. She did that. She made us learn verses. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, she tr- you double-minded. I'm sure that was about us that she prayed that. Man, we had to learn those things. It was part of who we were, you know? It's still part of my life and who I was. And when we came to the end of that class after that year, I was so happy because I thought, man, I'm getting out of my grandma's sight. This is, works out good. And you know what she did? She announced to everybody. She said, I'm going to stay with this group of boys. And I'm going to, every time they go to a new classroom, I'm going to be their teacher. I'm going to see them all the way through school. (laughs) I thought, Lord, you've got to help me here. What have you done? But see, she did a good job, you know. She thought, I've got to teach my grandson and all these other kids not to stray from that. I've got to hold on to it. They've got to do that. That's part of our heritage. That's who we are, friends. That's what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. That's when Jesus says, remember those things. Get them back into your mind. Remember those people. You know, go out to the graveside. You look at those folks, you think, I remember when, and you tell the story, and especially a story that talks about people who are strong in their faith, even if what they did was nothing more than to say, I'll pray for you, or I seek God to really be, you know, a difference in your life, or even invite you to church. So today, what I'm going to do is a little interactive thing for you, okay? I want you to help me with this, all right? What I want you to do, uh, I told you a story about my grandma, who she was and what she did. I want to know who played, made a difference in your life that got you here into the seats this morning. You with me? Who got you here into these seats this morning? Who was it that was a, an amazing witness to you who provided that kind of invitation and who saw that you were an influence to get you into this place? Now, I want you to think about that just for a minute. There may be people you're thinking of all the time. For some of you, you may have to go back a little bit. For some of you, it's okay exercise to do. Go back and think of those people who got you here. It may be somebody who was a Sunday school teacher. It may be a pastor. Maybe somebody else who was there. Maybe somebody who was an influence in your life. Maybe your mother, your father, whoever. Someone who played that role as an influence and got you here into this place. Now think about that just for a second. You got that person in your mind? Get a little picture of them, what they look like. Think a little bit about who they were and and what they did and that influence. That's, that's a tribute to them and their life and living. Now, I don't want it not to go unspoken. So what I want you to do is turn around to some people that are around you. If you're all lonely, I may have to come over and see you unless you join a group. So, But I, I want you to... <laughs> I love her, I tell you. What I want you to do is take a moment to talk, maybe get together in groups two, three, whatever you want to do, just around here. I'm going to give you about uh, three, four minutes. But what I want you to do is uh, talk among yourselves. And tell the story. Tell who the person was and what they did for you, okay, as a, as a remembrance about how, who brought you into this church, who got you here, who made an influence for you. You all with me? 
Okay, very good. Go ahead and try it. Um, when did I do that? Yeah. I don't know. Do you need some? I have them in there. Rodney, he's got some of those rocks. Or if you didn't bring your rock of remembrance or you put it out in your, in your house, you can uh, put that there. Uh, let me just finish up. Uh, and one of the things is remembering and being part of that is, is to remember why, uh, why people put this church together and put it here in this place um, and, and the importance of what that is. You know, sometimes in our churches today, one of the challenges is, is that our churches, and it's one of my pet peeves, but sometimes one of our churches no longer are like churches. They're like clubs. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, I've been in churches where it's been a real struggle for me sometimes. I've looked at those churches and, you know, somehow they've forgotten what their mission was, what they were really all about and what they were supposed to do. Sometimes we fix up churches not to make it look good so people come in and be part of that and balance that out with our faith thing, but sometimes we find ourselves struggling with, with what that means. Last uh, few weeks, uh, we've been talking about this block party that's coming up and all that. I was so shocked last year when I saw that block party. I heard people come from everywhere, but then I wasn't the only one that was shocked. Everybody, 
seem to be that way. Everything else, we're starting to do the planning for that, put that together. And of course, I, I, I seek sometimes to try to be this little voice in the wilderness. So people have been writing back and forth about what they're going to do, and I've been writing in and saying, "Oh man, I tell you, okay." But if we do this, we got to think about how we also going to get ourselves ready and our church ready. How are we going to be ready? It's not a party for us just to go sit in the corner and talk to everybody we know. You know, it's like like camp. You take everybody's chair away so they got, except, you know, folks need to sit in their chair. <laughs> Put a bunch of other chairs around you, you know, so people have a place to sit. You can carry on conversations with people, get to know who they are, you know, and then invite them into the church. That's a critical thing. That way we don't die from, from what our ministry is, but we're involved to do the ministry that Christ has called us into. We're not, a, we're not a place of perfected people. We're a hospital for sinners. That's what it's like. That's who we are. We're, we're a lighthouse, but, but we're there for a reason and purpose. We're out there to, to save people's lives, to bring them in, to give them a word of hope. Because some of those people are struggling with that. This past week, we were in Massachusetts. There's lighthouses all over the place. But you know what? Most of those lighthouses are just little symbols, signs of what used to be. This used to be a lighthouse. We don't have a light anymore. We don't even use it anymore. We got other things to do, you know? Or some of them that turned out to be places that were trying to shelter people and help them turn out to be now, uh, 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 they're not life-saving stations, they're, they're supper clubs. You know, they are, I can't believe it. The number of supper clubs up and down the coast who, who, who now turn themselves from light, life-saving stations into these supper clubs, etc. cetera. And, and, I, and I ask that because I have to ask that about our question about our church, you know? As a pastor, I get to fill out the statistical things every year about a church. And I know some churches have really been kind of challenged when all of a sudden it says, how many new people have you added to your church? And I get to put down the number zero. And I'm thinking, no way. You know, that's not what we're about. For us to be in legacy and in remembrance of those who brought that for us and people you've been sharing about today, we carry that on. And we do the, just as much preparation as we do with any other thing in the church. There's ways that we look around and see and we plant the seeds and invite them to do so. I found this little video. It's a thing about life-saving stations. I want you to see it and uh, share it together. <clears throat> On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was no more than a hut, and there was only one boat. But the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. With little to no thought for themselves, they went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding areas wanted to become associated with the station and give their time and money and effort to support the work. New boats were brought in and new crews were trained. And the little life-saving station grew. Some of these new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those who were saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they began to use it sort of as a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in this club's decor, and there was a memorial lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and some of them were foreigners. The beautiful new club was in chaos immediately. The property committee hired someone to rig up a shower outside the club, where victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. The outsiders made the life-saving station extremely dirty. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities because they felt that they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. But a small number of members insisted upon life-saving as their primary mission and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. After all, the dissenting group's members were voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So they did. As the years went by, however, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old station. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. 
history continue to repeat itself. And if you visit that eastern seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters. But most of the passengers drown. Let's join in prayer together. God, you called us to be a church. Not just people that paint signs, but people who are actually the church. I give you thanks for this congregation. God, we are, we are known by our love and our faithfulness within this community. We're known by the acts of unselfish giving that we give and the offers that we make to be part of that community, not just in that community. God, I give you thanks for every person here, even for those that are not here this day but are part of the Memorial Day weekend. And I, I just ask God you'll be with the people in this community who are, find themselves lost and shipwrecked and people who just find themselves at a point in their life when they're just in need of a shepherd to come and find them. Jesus, you said that we're to be like that good shepherd just like you are. We'll leave the 99 and go find the ones that are lost and we'll rescue them. Not to chastise them, but to pick them up and carry them and tend to their hurts and wounds and bruises and bring them back into the fold, the security, the fellowship, the community of faith. That's what Go Be the Church is all about. God, I give you thanks for this sanctuary, for this place of gathering. And I give you thanks, oh God, for the opportunity of people who are here, but not just those that are in this church because that's not what we do. We're out there in the community. We're out there seeking ways to make a difference. And I give you thanks for that. Whether it's the youth in our church and the invitation of so many that were here a few weeks ago who, who may be not officially part of our church, but part of that group, and it's a life-saving group. For the people who are part of United Methodist Women, they're, they're a life-saving group. For the people in this congregation who serve in so many ways, we're a life-giving church. Help us to refine that and make that happen. Help us to, to have a new goal for us that's your goal, to be in your ambassadors. To find three people that could this year for the remainder of time can come be part of this fellowship so that we, we continue to grow not only in spirit but also in numbers. Because God, we know that you want that. <laughs> and God only knows the number of people we have in our towns and communities who, who are in need of being saved, who are in need of of life-giving forgiveness who need to be part of understanding the love of Christ. And now be with us as we offer ourselves to you on this Sunday of remembrance. For this we ask in your holy name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. As the ushers come forward to receive our morning offering, the offering today is also for Uganda. And if you need a special envelope, uh, just let folks know and we'll be glad to, uh, to make that.